Hi everyone, uh, I'm Simon. I work as a data scientist at Envoice. We are making some uh, recommender system for news media organizations, for uh, e-commerce websites, and even now for uh, advertisers. Uh, we use a graph-based recommender system in our technology. And recently we had to inject some semantics into these graphs we use uh, to make recommendations. During my talk, uh, I will explain why we use graph-based recommender system, why we had to uh, inject some semantic links into them, and uh, how we do it. So why we use graph-based recommender system, it uh, comes from our history. A few years ago, we were actually developing Facebook applications. Here are two of them, uh, one of the main ones. Uh, in this one, you could buy uh, emoticons to share on your Facebook timeline. And this one was a dating Facebook application. For both of these applications, we needed a recommender system to find uh, what the user would like the most. For example, here it would be um, uh, this emoticon, this AV emoticon. Um, so the data we had came naturally uh, in a structural graph, because there were a mix of uh, user actions from our applications, uh, buy, view, add to basket, and social data from Facebook, your friendship with other users and uh, your likes, mainly. And we used the same principle for all our applications. We kept all the data into the, the graph, and we computed some kind of distance between the uh, user and the object we would like to recommend. And this distance depends on every path that exists between this user and the, obje the object you want to recommend. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these apps were victims of another recommender system, uh, the one from Facebook, because a few years ago, they decided to uh, favor advertising over third-party applications. And uh, so we, our reach on the Facebook timeline went down, our virality went down, the, uh, the, uh, the applications were no longer profitable. Uh, so we had to close them all, and we decided to sell the algorithm instead. But that was our first project, as the marketing team uh, presented. It's a graph where you put all your uh, relationships you have, it can be the tagging from the catalog, the user actions uh, from the tracking on the web, view, buy, add to basket, etc. And maybe sometimes uh, action that you, that you can make directly on the tags. Uh, for example, if you declare that you like color or ground or something like that. And the idea is the same, is to find, depending on the distance between the user and uh, the object, uh, to compute a probability that he will uh, click on it, or even buy it. Uh, of course, I, as you can imagine, it's not that simple. Uh, these are very uh, small world graphs with high connectivity, high density. Uh, and we have to make a lot of pre-processing on these graphs to shrink them, to aggregate some interactions uh, until they are uh, more significant and also smaller and more uh, traversable in real time. Here is a view on our um, simplified view of our general workflow at Envoice. We have uh, a full graph with all the interaction, interactions that we could collect it, uh, on the web and with the catalog, etc. Et and we will uh, aggregate them, it's the, the role of the graph processor, to uh, make a reduced graph that could fit in a data, uh, some database like Mongo or Elasticsearch. Uh, and that we can traverse uh, in real time to compute probabilities. And that would be the role of the recommender. Depending on the relations he found on this part, he will compute a probability of that uh, the object we selected will be uh, clicked and, or, or bought by the user. Uh, of course, there are uh, many ways to make these aggregations. Some are better than others, and that's why, uh, in a classic way, we collect successes and failures of all our recommendations to learn to make a better decision, both in the graph processor and the recommender. 
Here are, uh, are some use cases of this technology. Uh, Ticketac is a site that sells um, tickets for venues, uh, theater, cultural events. But this website is actually owned by the Figaro. And we can also use some user actions on the cultural page of the Figaro to improve our recommendation. Uh, another example would be uh, OKID that sells uh, clothes for kids, but we can also use actions on their blog. They have a lot of content that we can use to uh, both improve recommendation and expand uh, our targets. Uh, all of this works well as long as uh, the, ob the object that you want to recommend exists in the graph and uh, as nodes and are connected to the rest of the world. For one of our recent projects, it was not the case. It was for the Prisma Group. Prisma Group is a news corporation that owns uh, famous publications like Gala, uh, Geo, uh, Femme Actuelle, and so on. And they wanted to use the readings on their publications on the web to uh, personalize their advertising. Um, of course, it's a new campaign that does not exist in the graph. There was no action on it. So we had to reconstitute some path between the user and the campaign. Um, at first, we wanted to use the editorial tagging that exists, but it's of very low quality, not standardized, not exhaustive between publications. So we had to do that by ourselves. For the automatic tagging, we used the latent semantic uh, analysis. At first, we have uh, the corpus. It's all the articles published uh, on the web uh, uh, from the Prisma group. We do a bit of um, text processing, corpus processing, limitization, entropy computation of all the world. Then we build a documentaire matrix. Each row will be a document, and each column an expression. And uh, at the intersection, you would find a function of the occurrence of the world in the document and uh, the entropy of the world. Uh, once it's done, we perform a truncated, truncated singular value decomposition of this matrix. Uh, we decided to keep about 250 highest singular values. And this way, you can have a semantic space of 250 dimensions where you can project all your documents and turn them in vector of 250 dimensions. In parallel, we asked our marketing team to, uh, to make a list of all the words they think a marketing operator would like to query in the corpus. And they came up with uh, uh, 40,000 uh, words. And uh, with the same uh, matrix, we can also project all of them in the same space. And then, in this space, you can, co you can compute any cosinus between uh, the term, the vector representation of the term, and the vector representation of the document. And if this cosinus is above a certain threshold, you would consider that uh, this term can be associated to uh, the document. But that's not quite done. Uh, here is a recap of our path. Here is the user. We have uh, links with the, the product. It just came from tracking on the web, so that's easy. Second part I just uh, talked about is uh, attribution of a topic to a content. And then we uh, have to make the last link is the topic to uh, the campaign. And it's not as easy as it seems, uh, because it can be very, very subjective. As a matter of fact, when we launched our first experiment, uh, we had very variable results in terms of performance, uh, depending on uh, what they chose. Uh, the, the marketing operators tend to choose very generic words because uh, they want uh, big targets, uh, and they, they are used to uh, use segments for their campaign. Uh, and the, the, the segment can be just uh, your women, woman of a certain age, for example. It's very broad. But we encourage them to be uh, as specific as possible. I, I would even say as literal as possible 
if you want to sell a uh, moisturizer, for, for example, this one, you just put moisturizer on and choose just that topic. It would be uh, not a big target, but you can let the graph find the extensions you need to have a manageable target with enough volume to uh, an ad campaign. So that's kind of path we can uh, use to make the, the extension. That's the path that will be uh, queried in our graph processor. For example, a direct semantic link is just because these topic, uh, topics appear uh, very often in the same uh, article. But that could be also a mix of behavioral and semantic um, uh, path uh, links. Here you have uh, a topic associated to an article as you to a user, article, and topics. Here we could find, for example, that people interested in moisturizer are also interested in food supplements, so you can also use this topic for your ad campaign. Uh, so uh, I, I just talked about the, our main product, the recommendation. Our second one, uh, it's uh, the one mixing semantic and uh, and basic <coughs> graph-based recommendation. And we just launched a few months ago a new one for digital advertising. It's exactly the same principle. There's no semantic in it, uh, but uh, uh, it's with very, very, very uh, much, much, much larger graph. Uh, and uh, the purpose of all of this is to make real-time personalized advertising for a new user that never went on your website, just like Criteo is doing right now. And if I mention it, it's because of my last slide, and be the most important one. Uh, we uh, also need to hire, we also need talents. So uh, if you're interested in working for Envoys, uh, you are welcome to contact us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Simon, for this talk. So do anybody in the audience have any questions? So how do you uh, compute the, the relatedness uh, based on behavioral uh, connections? How do you weight the connections between users and articles and stuff like that? Between users? Oh, OK. It's, it, that's part of our more general uh, graph processing. It's uh, mostly based on, uh, it, it will be part of the distance we compute. It's not very different from the traditional graph-based recommender system where we, not, we do, do not have semantic links. Actually, that would be the same. Hi, thank you for the call. Um, what about the size of the graph? You didn't talk about the volumes you are handling, actually. The first graph, when it's highly dense graph, and then the trim graph. What are the size of you are dealing with, actually? Right. Okay. In, um, in our full, full graph, we have uh, we have how many relations? The CTO is, doesn't even know. It's uh, a few billion uh, relationships, but we won't use all of them. Uh, actually, we, we cannot, uh, we don't have just one graph processing for all of our projects. We will build one reduced graph. Because for um, several reasons, and the main one is that we cannot do that. The, the, uh, customer provide us our, their relation and their data, and we cannot use them to uh, make recommendations for others. Any other question? Thanks for the talk. Uh, I would like to know how you evaluate your model. Sorry? How do you evaluate your model? Ah, um, it's uh, it's not um, it's very classical. We have uh, we have um, each time we make a recommendation, we uh, we collect the the results of it, success and or failure, and then we have all the traditional um, all the traditional uh, ways to, uh, to 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 know if that's efficient. We can compute the uh, likelihood of, our, of, the, of the function uh, we use to uh, make the, the probabilities. 
uh, we can uh, build rock curves. Um, it's not different from um, another system because you have data and on the input and you have the results, results of our, in our, your output and we have function optimizing that in the middle. Any other question? Okay, I had one. Uh, you seem to address several different problems using your recommender system. Do you have the same recommender system for everything or for each problem do you have some specificities? No, at the core we have the same system, that is uh, the one I presented in a general workflow, and the rest is some kind of sugar. For example, the, uh, we had semantic links, but that's to uh, go back to our main system. It's just to, uh, to use it at the end, like every other project. And the last one, uh, it's the same, it's different. It's technologically, it's very different, but because the graphs are much larger, so uh, we have some uh, challenges but mathematically, it's not that different. Okay. Yes. And so, um, do you pre-compute uh, all the similarities? Like for each item, you're going to pre-compute a list of candidates? Or do you go through the path to the, into the, to the graph uh, online? No, the, we cannot do that online because it's, it's, it's too big and it's not efficient. There are some relations that um, evolve very slowly in time, so we don't have to. We can pre-compute them uh, at night, for example. It's the same that Facebook will do. It will pre-compute the links with your friends. It you know that you can pre-compute it and do that uh, every day or every week. It will not change uh, very often. But if you just published something on your timeline, it doesn't want to wait for. Uh, uh, one day, even one hour, to uh, show it on your timeline. So it's always a balance of the two. Everything that uh, evolves slowly in our function, we tend to uh, pre-process it, and everything that we have to, uh, to be very fresh, we, we compute it in real time. Uh, how you deal with cold start? With cold start, yeah. um, uh, so for for the uh, for the first two products, uh, very bad, uh, and for but, but it's not a large part of our, of our recommendation actually. For most of our website, it's not really a problem, and for the last one, it's with the, for the middle one, it's semantics. It's with the, uh, with introduction of semantic links. Okay, thank you for your question. Thank you for your talk, Simon. Thank you.